This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Most people hate the sound of their own voice. We have, of course, various and sundry pals who seem to love the sound of their own voice, and we know exactly what characteristics comprise such a charming quirk, but right now, we're talking about the most of us, the larger portion of the Venn diagram comprised of the two circles human being and winces when hearing a recording of themselves. Of course, the wince of the wince is complicated, more often than not, when one is witnessing themselves through some recorded medium. There is no shortage of material seemingly deserving of deeply serious critical scrutiny, especially if the medium is video. Like, oh my god, is that how I stand? Why am I doing that with my hands? My hair looks awful. Why did I wear that top? Which is to say, situations in which one might be listening to oneself bring about an already heightened sense of dread. And so the voice, its sound, will of course come under scrutiny because more likely than not, you are scrutinizing everything. This show is about sound, though, so we're going to focus on the vocals and ask after an explanation of why we do so hate the sound of our own voices. The answer, as it turns out, is rather simple, and also not. You hate the sound of your own voice because you don't ever hear it, unless you make a podcast that you edit yourself. Then you listen to your own voice a lot, and it never stops being weird. But unless you make a podcast, or are on a TV show that you also watch religiously, or something of that sort, you never really hear your voice. The voice you do hear when you talk isn't really, quote-unquote, yours. That's the complicated part. How and why you don't ever hear your own voice, even though, if you're like most people, you've spent more time with yourself than any other person. But before we get too much further, we have to talk a little about why voices, in general, sound the way they do. All kinds of things contribute to the sound of every person's voice. A fair amount of them are anatomical, the size and power of their lungs that push air through the vocal cords, which have their own size and shape and are controlled by the muscles of the larynx to adjust pitch and tone. The shape of their head and mouth, including the palate, tongue, and lips, then filter, articulate, and amplify that sound. But then there's also what's called a dispersive medium. It's the stuff that the sound produced by all of that body junk has to travel through on the way to the ears of a listener. We're used to listening to people through the dispersive medium of air, which is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, and some other stuff. Maybe when you were a kid, you tried to have conversations with your friends underwater at the beach or a pool. Water is the dispersive medium there. You've probably played with helium as a dispersive medium, and if you're really lucky... You might have even experimented with sulfur hexafluoride in your high school chemistry class or something, which has the opposite effect of helium. All of these dispersive media make your voice sound different because of their density. 
Helium is lighter than air, so when you inhale it into your lungs and then push it through your vocal cords to create speech, the actual vibrations, the disturbances in the ether that comprise sound that are generated by your vocal apparatus, they move faster through it. And so the pitch goes up. The opposite is true of sulfur hexafluoride. Since it's heavier than air, the vibrations move more slowly. So much like what happened at Queensland University, the pitch drops. Interestingly, and as a complete digression, if you ever do inhale sulfur hexafluoride, you have to stand on your head once you're done sounding like Darth Vader. Because since it's heavier than air, it will never leave your lungs. Helium, because it's lighter than air, will just naturally float out of your body and dissipate as you talk. But sulfur hexafluoride, until you turn yourself upside down and let it fall out of your body, it will just stay there. Which, you know, it's probably not good for you. Okay, so anyway, why all of this talk about dispersive media and the speed of sound pressure waves through them? What does this have to do with the sound of one's own voice? Well, I'm glad you asked. I bring this stuff up as a way to contextualize the dispersive medium that you hear your own voice through, which isn't, at least not nearly entirely, air. It's also bone and, like, meat and stuff. Your own experience of your voice is not a wholly sonic one, the way it is when you're listening to someone else. Your experience of your voice is a sonic and a physical one. Your voice vibrates inside your own head and chest. You feel it in addition to hearing it. And actually, you even hear a lot of it as an effect of feeling it. Your own voice is conducted through your bones and into your head. As a matter of fact, it's an arrangement of bones in the ear, including the smallest bone in the human body, the stirrup, that transmit vibrations to the parts of the inner ear that do all of the hearing heavy lifting. So, when you are hearing your own voice, recorded, you're listening to it the way other people hear it, sonically, divorced from a physical experience, which, because of how the conduction of sound through bone works, gives your voice a more impressive tenor, pun intended. It sounds a little deeper, more moving, it has more oomph. When hearing their own voices, people tend to reel at how nasal they sound, how hollow or empty, how flat or lacking in nuance. But rest assured, the way you hear your voice in your own head is just as strange to everyone else as you think your voice sounds when you hear a recording of it. The voice you hear inside your head sounds as weird and wrong to me as your recorded voice sounds weird and wrong to you. Now to test this hypothesis, I've invited my good friend Jason Oberholzer. Hello! He's a musician, vocalist, co-founder of the awesome and soon to have a birthday Tumblr blog, I Love Charts, to hang out with us. We're going to talk a little bit about hearing one's own voice, and then we're going to take a recording of Jason, his voice picked up by the microphone here in the studio, and we're going to try to make it sound to us the way it sounds to him in his head. So he's going to guide me while I'm at the controls, while I change the way his recorded voice sounds, in an attempt to get it to sound to him outside his head the way it sounds inside. All right, Jason, ready to do this? Let's do it. I've been thinking uh, in preparation for this of trying to make sure I don't do like self-conscious voice. That's a very good... Right? Yeah. Because there's a thing when like one is on the phone or when one knows they're being recorded where the voice gets a little more mellifluous and it like hits the baritone a little yeah. harder right around there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I want to try to keep it in my normal really shitty nasal voice, <laughs> which I fucking hate, but I guess I'll have to listen to you gotta, yeah, it's in part, this context. Thank, thank you for uh, maintaining yeah. the, the objective nature <laughs> of the... So do you so do you have a lot of experience listening to your own voice or cuz you I mean you do music and stuff. I have heard my own voice in the context of music, in the context of podcasts, over the radio, 
and on video, like from a YouTube broadcast, as it were. So you have you have a fair amount of experience of listening yes. listening to yourself. Yes, I've hated it every time. <laughs> it doesn't get any better. It's just all gradations of self loathing. The first time I heard my voice, I was a singer in the church growing up. My mother is a church organist and choir director. And I had trained with her a long time for the St. Nicholas Medal, which is a medal in the Anglican tradition you get as a kid if you're good at singing. And as part of that, we recorded me singing to listen back and get notes. I was probably 12. And this was the first time I'd ever heard my voice back. And it shocked me to the core. It was like a thing I guess I somehow self-identified with. I think we all identify with our voices as being an important part of who we are. Right. Um, and when you're training that hard at it, you really get to know all the nuances of it. And there are things you feel like you're doing that are transmitting. Um, without... well, you, have a, you have a feeling in your body of what your voice is doing. Right. And so you expect that to manifest yes. to down other to, people. Down to a very nuanced level. Your volume curves and your tonal changes are things you think are happening everywhere. And then you hear your voice, and they're not happening anywhere. And I remember sounding like a really nasal trumpet that was like <laughs> entirely not resonating in my body at all. I, I guess this is like some of the ideals of Anglican church singing is like this very clear, like bell tone, all right. head voice. Oh, yeah. Yep, entirely not in my chest at all. Uh, I hated it. I hated it. <laughs> Nothing I thought I was doing was happening, and I didn't really know how to, how to justify that with the artistic choices I believed I was making. Now that we've we've gotten a little bit of a sense of how you sound, right? We're gonna let's experiment now and see if we can make you sound in a speaker. All right, the way that you sound to you in your head. Let's dial in the gravitas. Okay, so we chose this part. The first time I heard my voice, I was a singer in the church growing up. My mother is a church organist and choir director as the sort of representative vocal snippet you feel like this is like this sounds this is exactly the same voice i hate every time i'm recorded okay so we're starting from a good we're starting from a good baseline yes and now what we're going to do is we're going to try to make this sound more like what you hear inside your head you can pick up the frequencies that uh feel stronger to me already They're like no 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 like all the ones around there when those come out those are the ones we should probably boost like the sort of rumbly right as low as i get as low as okay yeah. the first time i heard my voice i was a singer in the church growing up my mother is a church organist and choir director um yeah it's getting there i think also what needs to be done is rolling off some of the attack on the top now so now, like the top notes sound a little more rounded when they have my head to bounce around in. Um, so, so on. we'll lose lose some of the like high thousands of the range. Right. Okay. All right. Disperse them. The first time I heard my voice, I was a singer in the church growing up. My mother is a church organist and choir director. It's feeling a little compressed now. I'm not sure. Yeah, I wonder. I, part of me wonders if right we we boost the lows and then cut out some of the highs and it's going to kind of start to sound like a, like a telephone right we don't want to kill overtones yeah exactly so i wonder if maybe it's about not about cutting out the high audible frequencies but going and cutting out the stuff that's like really high you know like mouth clicking and spit and you know things moving around like if you cut those things out i wonder if it's going to sound more like what it sounds like inside your head okay let's try it yeah. The first time I heard my voice, I was a singer in the church growing up. My mother is a church organist and choir director. Uh, it might be interesting to get a little reverb in there uh, to flesh out the amount of time I get to hear this thing bouncing around in my own body. It's being a little canned. I feel like the attack we're really close on right now. Like the actual tone is right. getting there. Right. It needs to be as robust as I feel the experience of me speaking to be. Right. Which is you don't you don't hear yourself close mic'd. Correct. All right. Yeah, let's figure that out. The first time I heard my voice, I was a singer in the church growing up. My mother is a church organist and choir director. That's feeling pretty good. It's still a little dry for my experience. Um, I would put my voice through a tube preamp to give it some warmth. Is that aspirational? We can do that. Might be aspirational. <laughs> the first time I heard my voice, I was a singer in the church growing up. My mother is a church organist and choir director. Do we do it? 
That's feeling pretty good. Okay, let's let's go back and listen to the first one now, and then see okay. how far we came. Okay, God, I hope there's a difference. The first time I heard my voice, I was a singer in the church growing up. My mother is a church organist and choir director. It is wildly different from... Wildly different. It, it is the person I hate, and I would rather listen to the person I desire to be. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, maybe uh, there's a future podcast where you can come by and we can record you and give you exactly the voice yes. that you want which i feel like i'm i have the suspicion that we would just like pitch it down i think my best self needs a tube preamp okay if you can put that in my chest i might become a futurist okay that's that that's what's going to get you to side on yep. to transhumanism i'm in is all right cool now that, now we know uh thanks for coming by jason pleasure So, over a drink, a little while later, Jason and I talked more about this and the fact that maybe the head voice sound that we ended up at after several iterations wasn't as weird as we thought it was going to be. It certainly wasn't as weird as I thought it was going to be. That, I mean, it doesn't sound to me like Jason, but it does, in a lot of ways, sound similar to what I hear inside my head when I talk. The characteristics that Jason was trying to hone in on were ones that were recognizable to me. After a while, I began to be able to intuit what Jason was looking for because as I was dialing in the sound he was describing, it started to sound less like Jason, but more like what Jason might sound like inside my head. Which, I mean, yeah, I realize that's a weird thing to say, but also it's kind of strangely comforting to have that kind of experience of someone else's voice that like here it is this this is them from their perspective but really it's not so shocking it's different but it's understandable you can see some relationship to it based on your experience of your own voice anyway for what it's worth this is what i think i sound like inside my own head I'll post the recipe we used to make our recording of Jason sound like his head voice on Instagram. Uh, it won't work for everyone. Actually, I'm really curious to find out how this process would work for a woman with a much higher voice. Maybe that can be a supplement for a later episode. But anyway, I'll post the recipe on Instagram. And if you have the time or gear and a friend who can help you out or whatever, give it a shot and post your results. I want to hear what it sounds like inside your head. And until next time, I'm Mike Rignetta. And this podcast has been reasonably sound. Mm-hmm.